evening. Good evening. We have a few people coming in, getting to their seats, so I'll give you guys a second. Give us two. We, we, you know, rang the bell technically like a minute early, so you're right on time there, Perry. You're good to go, brother. <laughs> Diane, good evening. Well, let's open up to Acts chapter 8. Give everybody a second to get to their seats. Acts chapter 8, while they're sitting down. You look like it. You look like I seen I'm the here. wheel turning. I'm here. You're here. Okay. <laughs> Thought you had something to say. <laughs> <laughs> She's like afterwards when the mic is off. Hello. <laughs> All right. Well, good evening, everybody. We're gonna get ready to get started. Uh, just before we get in, a little uh, little clarification. Um, Karen emailed the. X, or not the X, I'm sorry, the Sunday Morning Foundational Pillars uh, study notes uh, at 3 o'clock today. So you probably, just in the last few hours, uh, you should have received that. If you don't have it in your email, make sure you check your spam, because uh, Tom went to his, but Barb said hers went to her spam, but she checked and she found it there. So check your spam or your junk folder, depending on your service, they call it one or the other. Um, so check there. What I would encourage you to do is we uh, narrowed it down from like 38 pages. Uh, Ken said it was 22, right? Uh, so that's pretty good. But now remember, it's we've been doing this class for you know three weeks now. You know what I mean? Uh, and then that, that, those notes go through this upcoming Sunday, so it's really like a month's worth of notes. Um, you know what I mean? That you'll have that you could actually print. Now what I would suggest is uh, don't just open it and print it. We all read a little bit differently, right? Or I, say, I take that back. We all have a little bit different eyesight, right? So I, I, the font that it's going to print on automatically will be 12 font. But you could change it to whatever you want. You can just save the file. Uh, and then when you open the document, you can go in there and highlight it, you know, like you copy and paste something. And you could change the font to whatever you want. And if you need it to be a 14 or a 16 or an 18, that's completely up to you at that point. Um, but I just wanted to point that out so you don't just go and print it right away uh, because I was looking at uh, Sherry's. Hers is actually printed for some reason smaller than even what I emailed it out as. Uh, hers is real small. But just save it, then you can adjust it to whatever you want and then go ahead and print it. And then if you don't have a three hole punch, because not everybody's going to have a three hole punch, print it when you come out, when you come, we'll have one on the back table here in the back left hand corner. Uh, and. You guys can three-hole punch them as you come in if you need a three-hole punch. That way you can throw the information in the binder. The reason uh, we have these binders made is because you know this is information. I don't want you guys to just look at this one time. I, I want you guys to don't just you know print it, put it in there, and throw it in the, on a bookshelf with the rest of the books that you never read. Right? We want us to be able to go in there, you know, periodically and refresh your memory. Because this is all the foundational stuff. You know, these are the things that we need to have ready knowledge of or, or, uh, or ready answers for as we talk to friends and family members and coworkers. And so, uh, Ken? Will you send out the Sunday lesson a week before? It's oh, you want me to send it out before I even have it done? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> because you said we already have. Yes, well, I... Because since I was already working already on my other notes, I just threw this, this week's notes in with it. Okay. So that's why, so the notes you have today will take you through the Sunday's class. It, it's also helpful, David, if we, if all of us, we get those notes and then the following week we study them. Yeah. And then we're prepared for the next week's lesson. Yep. It also has the memory verses in there. So yep. let's don't forget, what memory verse are we on this week, guys? Acts 17. Acts 17.30, that's correct. Acts 17.30. Pam's been on it, too. She's been like, she's like, I got this. All right, let's jump into Acts chapter 8 now. I just wanted to kind of do some house cleaning real quick and clean that up and make sure that we're all aware of it. And if you have questions in regards to the notes, please let me know. One last thing I will tell you. 
Um, so in the different sections, like for the, the first foundational pillar, at the end of that section, before we get into the second pillar, uh, which is the Bible is the word of God, I have on there where you could go to get the additional information that, you know, the other, you know, it was 38 pages, where you could go to get it, right? Uh, so I put on there a link for Brad Harab's website um, where you could get the book Convicted, uh, a, science, a scientific review of evolution, uh, World Video Bible School. It's video dot, um, what is it, online video, I think it is, uh, dot org. Yeah. So there's that one. Uh, and then the other one was the uh, Apologetics Press. But those are on there. So you could go to the site, you could get additional information. And then for your own, because make the binder whatever you want, customize the binder, right? I'm just giving you the notes that we're doing in class. You could add as much or as little as you want, right? So make it, have it to be kind of like a living, breathing tool. Uh, kind of like, you know, when you're, in, if you're ever in sales, you know, we have business plans, right? The business plan wasn't a one and done, right? It was, it was a living, breathing tool. At least it was supposed to be uh, for the people Changed who were, every day. Yeah, for the people who were actually hitting budgets, it should have been. But uh, I just wanted to throw all that information out there. And the same thing with the second pillar, you'll also find additional resources to go and get more information for yourselves. All right, so Acts chapter 8, if your Bibles are open. Candy, good evening. Late. Pat, <laughs> Leslie, good evening. Candy. All right, Acts chapter 8, let's jump into this. We get into uh, this, and we're going to start to see where the very first verse we're going to basically is a continuation of the previous uh, chapter. Why? Because we see how the Apostle Paul is the persecutor of the church. And when you look at this, and we'll, we'll, we'll break it down here in a second, but just let's read the first verse. Saul was, uh, it says, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And it's talking about Stephen, right, from the previous chapter. And it says, and on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. So before we move any further, I want us to pause there, because, you know, when, when we study it out, and, and if, you, if you listen to, you know, preachers and teachers long enough, it really kind of seems like um, everybody just kind of thinks that the persecution was continuous all the time, every day, every week, every month, and it was just a miserable existence. That's really not the case. Um, if you look at Acts chapter 8, with, uh, we know that obviously when they went to the temple, the, the, the apostles, you know what I mean, they were, they were spoken against the first time, right? Uh, in Acts chapter 3 and then in Acts chapter 4, they were spoken against the, uh, against the Sanhedrin again and they were scourged that time. But it wasn't a ready, it wasn't um, a, 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 kind of like a Jerusalem, a citywide persecution, right? It was pretty much just the leaders of Judaism were unhappy with the apostles, right? Because they thought they were bringing this man's blood on, on, on their heads. So here we get to Acts chapter 8, and it tells us that it says Saul was in hearty approval, and it says a great persecution broke out against the church. And it makes that point because up until this point, about six or seven years have gone by. This isn't like, you know, a couple weeks after the church. Six or seven years have gone by with relative peace. You know what I mean? And so, yes, like I said, the leaders of Judaism spoke against them. But as far as the persecution from any and all Jews, it wasn't until you get to about this point. Because remember, if you guys remember at the end of last, the last couple of classes, I said... It was the leaders stirred up the Jews with false testimony uh, that was brought against Stephen. And then they, they kind of, they worked the people up into a wrath. So much so that the people weren't even quite sure why they were persecuting them because why they were doing it with false pretenses because they made up some accusations, right? Mm -hmm. And so you look at it here, it says, I, that's the only reason I want to point it out. On, and on that day, a great persecution began. Right? This they continued, began against the church about six or seven years into it. And so it's at this juncture that the Jewish persecution became uh, from the Jewish brethren. And people, uh, it, it started this way. And then while I'm talking, I want you to turn over to Matthew chapter 10. It started this way because you think about it. As we've went over the Gospels before, we've mentioned how 
Many of the Jews began to persecute friends, family, brethren. Why? Because they were afraid of being put out of the synagogue. And so the pressure from the Jewish, the Jewish leaders, the, the Sanhedrin, right, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, that was kind of like the pressure that was being put on the everyday members of their synagogues, now all of a sudden those members start to kind of rebel uh, against their family. And they start to actually, because they're afraid of being, being kicked out of the synagogue. I, I know I've mentioned John 12 and 42 before. It actually says those literal words there. Um, but notice what it says here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 39. Matthew 10, 34 through 39. Notice what it says. Do not think, this is Jesus, right? Do not think that I came to bring peace. I didn't come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. That's an interesting statement. For I came to set a man against his father. What? I thought Jesus was the prince of peace. I mean, isn't that what the Bible says of him? It says, for I came to set a man against uh, his father and a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be who? Will be the members of his own household. Rather, pause right there, verse 36. Stay in Matthew 10, because we're going to go a little bit further. This goes back to what Jesus was telling them back in Matthew chapter 10, verse 17. So look back just a little bit, a few more verses previous to 36. Look at verse 17. But beware of, for, of men. For it says, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in where? In their synagogues. Who's Jesus talking about here? It's talking about Jew on Jew, right? This isn't the Romans persecuting the Jews. This is the Jew, their Jewish brethren persecuting their fellow Jewish brethren, right? And so we see here, and then in verse 21 and 22 of Matthew 10, notice what it says. Brother will betray brother to death. Father, his child, children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end that shall be saved. You look at those verses before we continue on in verse 37 of that chapter. Who is they? You know, you look at verse 17. Uh, it says, but beware of men. For they, who is they? It's the rest of the Jews, but more specifically, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your friend. You see, it's your, it's your loved ones, your, the people that you trusted the most because of their fear of their leadership and being put out of the synagogue and knowing how wicked some of those Jewish leaders were, that persecution came upon their own family members. So what did it say there, right? In verse 21 and 22, brother will betray brother, father his child. The children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Now go back down to verse 37. You know what Jesus is telling us here? He's saying, guys, discipleship, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. In verse 37, it continues in Matthew 10. He who loves father or mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me. You're not worthy of me. In context, based on what I just said in, in verse 17, as well as 21 and 22, what is Jesus saying there? If you love father uh, or mother more than me, if you love son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy. What is he saying in context with what we just heard? Well, that sword that he was bringing was not a literal sword. As Ephesians, which we just studied for several nights last yep. week, the sword of the Spirit is the gospel of Christ. Yep. It's going to separate people and family members from yep. one another. And he uses the word sword because the sword is a symbol of war, right? And so it's not a symbol of peace. It's a symbol of, of war, destruction, division. And so Jesus is telling them at the beginning of this, before you go up a little further, that discipleship is going to be hard. But he's also letting them know that, listen, if you choose not to fully obey me because mother or father are upset with you, you're not worthy of me. If you choose not to fully obey me and submit because, well, I don't want to lose my children because my sons and daughters are more important than my, well, relationship with you, God, you're not worthy of me. Do you see the difference here? That's exactly the context that Jesus is talking about. So he says there in verse 38, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. What is the cross in context of verses 17 through 37 there? It's your commitment to 
It's your commitment. You got to be all in. If you're not willing to pick up your cross and potentially go against your mother and father's will, potentially cause a strain in your relationship with your children because you're all in for God, but your children want nothing to do with God, who must you side with? All right? Starts getting a little personal here, doesn't it? And so you get to verse 38 or 39, and it says, And he who has found his life, you may lose it. He who has lost his life for my sake, you'll find it. So you look at these verses here. Here we see that the word of God and preaching truth is going to cause one to become hated for their faith in Christ, even by their own families. Anybody ever have experience with that? It happens. It happens today. It happened in the previous generation and the generation before that, going all the way back. Right? And so there's going to be a strain that's caused when family members leave the Catholic faith, when family members leave the Lord's Church, when family members leave the Baptist Church, the Lutheran Church, the Methodist Church, right? When, you know, when you leave, uh, you know, the children who decide to leave and maybe go a different route than maybe they grew up with on the farm with the Methodist, not the Methodist, um, uh, the Amish and the Mennonites, right? All of a sudden, you're not welcome back unless you do what? You're willing to submit and fall back in line. What happens if you want to go a different route and go against their teachings? Right? What happens with Islam? What happens when my, if, I'm, if I'm raised in the Islamic church and I'm a faithful member of, of, of Islam and my son and daughter want to go, they want to become Christians. So I would just say, you know, you know cheer them on and wish them well. Or what, what do you think my response is going to be based on the Quran? Potentially could be put to death, right? Technically speaking, the truth that's the truth, right? But at least, minimum, disfellowship from the family. What is God saying is going to happen here with Christians? Nobody likes to have this conversation usually, right? But you can see what God is saying here. He's pretty clear. He's saying it's going to be difficult. There's going to be persecution. It's going to cause strain within the family because that's where the strain is going to come from. It said brother is going to put brother to death, right? Mother against fa uh, father and father against son and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and the list goes on and on. But we know here, brethren, that the goodness that is in the hearts of people, you know, the people with the good soil, when Jesus, when the word comes to them, when the message comes to them, people who have an open heart and open mind, it's going to be attractive to them. And it's going to, it's going, it's going to attract people who, are, who want to live morally upright and acceptable lives. That, it, you know, the message of the gospel, right? The message of the love of Christ is going to be attractive to them. But how attractive is that same message going to be to those of the world? Those who don't want to live according to God's moral standards. Those who want their cake and want to eat it too, right? Those who say, hey, I'm just going to keep bouncing around to different churches until I find a church that's going to tell me what I want to hear. Mm -hmm. Are there any churches like that today? Mm -hmm. Everywhere. So the goodness of Jesus will attract to itself all the good-hearted people. But likewise, those who have evil attentions... Those who have sin and darkness in their hearts and in their minds are also going to be tr attracted to people of like mind. Now, what happens when good and evil start to come together? There's going to be a clash, is there not? And so you think about it. When right goes forth into a world of wrong, there's going to be war. Spiritual warfare, right? That's whenever, what we're talking about. Whenever you, it doesn't matter where it is, David. Whenever you try to raise the standards in any organization, people battle it, mm -hmm. especially in the church yeah. and especially in our society. Yeah. Just look, literally look at what's going on all around us in our schools, right, in society, with all of this silliness of, you know, what you want to choose to identify as. You guys, I don't watch any of, I try not to watch any of this stuff, but I just happen to see it on some of the Fox News highlights. And whatever station, you know, I'm not saying that, but whatever station you choose to watch. But 
There was this Met Gala. Did you see like some of the people that are showing up as like cats in weird costumes and like they're dressed all like it's the weirdest thing. I'm sorry. The verse that I always say, he gave them up. Like, he, yeah, he Christy says, yeah, Romans chapter one says says it all. He he gave them up to, to go after their own degrading passions, I think it says in eighteen and following For through the very reasons you've mentioned. Peer pressure, except yeah. And what is the real motivator in that particular group? Money. Yeah. So back to this. When the right, God's standard, those who are morally right, go out into the world, there's going to be confrontation. And each principle, each party is going to have their own members, their own adherents, who are going to uh, put on their own armor and put up their own banner, so to speak, meaning the flag in which they're going to car carry into the battle it seems like every organization's got a flag now, right? And they're going to carry that organization, and they're going to paint it on the buildings, and they're going to wear it proud, and they're going to put it, they're going to tattoo it on their bodies, right? And it all does these things almost become a god unto themselves. And so we see that, that we see the terrible struggle is going to pursue until one or the other wins. Either heaven's going to win, or hell's going to win. Righteous is going to win, or unrighteousness is going to win. Are we going to get in the fight? Are we going to be willing to do what God requires of us, Tyler? Hey, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but uh, the righteousness is already won. We're kind of like in the, yeah. the passing of it here. Yeah, I mean, we know that, but it would, it, you know, but if you're somebody who really doesn't know that much about the Bible, you'd be hard pressed to understand that by looking at the church attendance. You'd be, you'd be hard pressed to really understand that righteousness actually wins in the end when you see what's going on every time you turn on the television. You see what I'm saying? And so, yes, Jesus wins in the end, but there's a reason why Matthew chapter 7 talks about there will be few who find it. See, most people think everybody's going to heaven. You guys have heard me say it you know, before. You know, nobody utters the words at a funeral, but people say all the time, well, at least they're in a better place. Did you know the same person I knew? <laughs> they could care two licks about Jesus or religion or anything else. But they're in a better place? Which place is that? The place they didn't believe in? Do you see what I'm saying? Right? There are going to be few who find it. And so I just, I'm pointing all of this out, not to have a negative tone, but I wanted to show you that this is where the beginning of the persecution, six, seven years into the, uh, to the uh, beginning of the church, and the persecution now is going to be widespread, so much so that you're going to see how Philip ends up outside of Jerusalem. All of the disciples flee Jerusalem, and it makes it sound like only the apostles are left, and just a few men that are going to make loud lamentations on behalf of Stephen. Any thoughts before we move on? Go ahead. Oh, you're just stretching uh, your hands. Peter tells us the Lord is patient. He wants all people to come into salvation. Amen. That's our responsibility. That's Matthew 28. Go and make disciples. Yeah. That's where our faith comes in. We know the end of the story. Yeah. Nevertheless, we have a responsibility yeah. to try to bring the gospel and try to bring salvation to as many people as will accept it. Amen. Because God wants all people to yeah. be saved. Barb? Okay, so I'm just getting into this. Six, so the first six to seven years, all of the apostles stayed in the Jerusalem area. Is that what you're saying? For the most part, they were in the Jerusalem area, and maybe just a few outliers, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. in that area, of, like Jerusalem, Judea. Okay, because then immediately after this, it says Philip is in Samaria. So mm -hmm. then immediately after Because what did that verse, what did the, yeah, the very first verse, what does it say? On that day it broke out, and all except the apostles. Yeah. So you look, let's, get, let's look at verse 1 and 2, and we'll keep going, and it'll answer the question. So we're back to verse 1 of Acts chapter 8. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day, this is where it begins, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And it says, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. So if we believe what the scriptures tell us there in verse 1, that then these individuals... Uh, <coughs> 
Christian converts spread out. So, you know, like when you're learning in these first few chapters where, you know, you had 3,000 in chapter 2, and then you had the multitudes, then, you, then you're up to like 5,000 by the end of chapter 3, and then there was the continue adding, right? And these are men, it's not just women and children too. But you're going to see how a lot of these start to disperse now because of the great persecution that's breaking out against the church. And so, you think about this. If you remember what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, he said, indeed, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And Jesus gave spiritual peace, did he not? Jesus was the Prince of Peace, and he came to bring spiritual peace that it tells us in Scripture that passes all understanding. That's what it says, right? But he gave that peace in the forms of forgiveness of sin. He gave that peace in the form of the hope of holiness and righteousness and justification to bring us back into a right relationship with the Father. And so to bring us satisfaction of what it means to be a true and obedient disciple of Jesus. But this peace, you know, a lot of people get it twisted. This peace is not given to the world. What do I mean by that? That this peace that Jesus came to bring is not given to the world. Well, it's only given to who? It's, it's, Faithful. And how do you become faithful? Jesus said, remember, the, our last memory verse, John 8 and 24, you will die in your sins. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So the, all of the world is welcome, but is his peace going to go to all of the world? No, because most of the world are going to reject Jesus. And if they reject Jesus, Jesus says you will die in your sins. And so Jesus came to save all, but make no mistake. Not all are going to be saved, amen? amen? And so that's why Jesus says, you guys have to go out. Who's you guys? Us! And the disciples in the first century, in the second century, and every century after that. Our job is to go out, to take the message, to preach to people, right? Not preach to people, that's probably a bad way of saying it, but to just take the message in love, to let people know about the love of God. Let them know that there is a God and that he loves you and that because of sin, it caused a separation. But God loves you so much, he sent his son to die on the cross so that way we could be reconciled to him. But the only way we could be reconciled to him is if we make Jesus the Lord of our lives. If we clothe ourselves with Jesus in baptism, right? And so the spiritual peace is only extended to those who make Jesus the Lord of their life. David. Go ahead. Paul called the gospel a mystery, and it was his responsibility to teach it and preach it so that it would not be a mystery. And it's still yeah. a mystery yeah. to those that haven't heard it preached or taught. Yeah. Well, it even, even Peter and them said, they said, hey, some of the things Paul says are difficult. Yeah. I mean, they say, but they're not impossible, right? They're difficult to understand some of the things that he says, but they're not impossible. But he does, you know, he mentions that. So I want to say that Jesus knew that his mission and truth would provoke persecution. Because he told them, he told his disciples before he died multiple times, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Right? And so the sword is a symbol of war. I know this because even in Luke 12 and verse 51, it says, do you suppose, Jesus says, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. Remember that question? If any of you listened to Jim's lesson, Jim said, he asked the question at the beginning of a Saturday morning lesson, is God a God of division or unity? And automatically we think, you know, we think, oh, the right church answer is, oh, he's a God of unity. Is he? Right? And then Jim literally gives like a whole long list of all of the separation. Go ahead. That is exactly what it means. So it's not a literal sword. The sword is the spiritual sword. It's the, it's the word of God. And so, but he, Jesus is telling us, going back to Matthew 10, and as well as Luke chapter 12 here, that that sword, that message, is going to cause division. Even, even, down, to the, every, even down to the family. From the family and every really relationship that you have, it's going to cause division. Because Jesus says, if you accept me, you have to be all in. You can't, be, you can't be a wishy-washy Christian. You know, we know what Jesus says about that in Revelation chapter 3. And so the, 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 the sword is basically a symbol of war. 
And so he knows it's going to bring civil commotion. He knows it's going to bring domestic discord. Uh, discord. But he says, you know what? You've got to take the message anyways. Right? When Jesus sent out the, the 12 and he sent out the 72 to go into the towns, right? He, says, he said to do what? If you find somebody who's going to, to, to accept your message, go into their house and stay there while you're there. But if somebody doesn't accept you, meaning they reject your message, meaning they reject me, you're to do what? Yeah. Did he say get all high and mighty and take it personally and get into a debate and argument with them? No, he just said, dust your sandals off and move on. You know why? Because there's a lot of people. And there's a lot of lost people. And there's a lot of people who need to hear the message that you're supposed to be bringing to them, right? In love. We continue on in verse 2 now of Acts chapter 8. That's like a good verse right there, right? That's like half a class. Acts chapter 8 and verse 2. So, uh, some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. So you note here that Luke says, uh, that, notice what Luke says in regards to Saul, the Apostle Paul, his attitude and his actions at the time. It says, looking at these first three verses, especially verse one, that he, he gave hearty, like a hearty approval, right? He was enthusiastic about his approval to agree to the killing of Stephen. What does that say about Paul? What does that say about his mindset? He was a zealot. He was a zealot, right? But well, really, what is a zealot? Well, someone who's very uh, active and, uh, and animated about what they believe. You know? Right. He didn't believe in uh, Jesus Christ at the time. Yep. But what he did believe in, he was fervent about. In order for him to do what he did, he had to be pure of heart in his belief. Right. He had no doubt in what he was doing was the right thing. He thought he was doing it on behalf of a holy and righteous God. And, he's, uh, and so I, I only say that because I want you to think about the people who, you know, like the, it, it, and Islam and others, right, that do these, uh, you know, what do they call it? There's a, there's a, the what? The horrific acts. Well, it's the horrific act of terrorism, but there's a name, uh, jihad. jihad, right? And so they're doing a jihad, right? They're doing it in the name of God. I believe that many of those people are probably very sincere yes. because they don't know about the love of Christ. What's different about Paul and those Muslims? His heart was open to change. Well, his heart was open to change, but maybe so are some of the Muslims. That, how many Muslims have you talked to? Right? So that's the key, right? So we have to take the message even to those that may look different than us. Paul they may believe different than us. The road to Damascus, the Lord got his attention. The Lord got his attention. But you know why the Lord got his attention? He was pure of heart. Right. He was pure in what he thought he was doing. Good. He was like a perfect Jew. Yeah. Perfect in his belief. You know how we talk about being righteous and blameless? You know how we talk about, uh, you know, John's parents, right? Zechariah and Elizabeth, right? We talk about Abraham and others that were called blameless, right? It, you know, they weren't perfect, but they were sincere in, their, in the heart of heart of their beliefs, right? And all that they did, they were sincere. And so you look at this information, and we know it says that he gave hearty approval. And it's on that day that Stephen's death that Saul begins this persecution. And that persecution, just so you know, it's about two or three years, approximately. Just from what we could tell in a timeline, it's about a two or three years before the road to Damascus. So you look at Acts chapter 8, and then you read Acts chapter 9, and you think, oh, he came to Christ probably pretty quickly. No, it was a couple, two, three years. And it was widespread. The people knew who Paul was. Not because of his love that he had for the church, eventually, but they knew who Saul was because of why? His persecution. Remember when God uh, went to Ananias? He said, hey, go, uh, and I'm going to send you to Saul. He says, you, you, won't, you won't do what? You, you know what he's doing, right? Well, he didn't just do it for a couple days. He had a reputation. Even when he went back to Jerusalem, everybody was afraid of him. Why? Because he had a reputation. And it wasn't because he was doing the right thing. Well, he thought he was, but we know that Jesus, and these are the, the critical words, because we know that God knows the hearts of men. And Jesus says, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. And he will stand before 
Jews and Gentiles and kings, right? And so we know that the Apostle Paul, uh, or Saul, turns in, goes to become the Apostle Paul, and goes on to be uh, probably the greatest disciple we've ever known. A lot of people think Peter, right? But, I mean, in reality, I mean, you look at all that Paul accomplished and all that he did and all that he suffered along the way, I'd say he's probably up there in the, in the top two or three when it comes to all-time most dedicated disciples. But why? Why do you think he was so dedicated? Because when you see what he was doing to the church when he was Saul, now he's got guilt on top of the fact that he wants to serve God with all his heart, and with all his mind, and with all his soul. He's all in. He's willing to suffer anything. He's willing to do anything. He's willing to talk to anybody. Why? Because he probably feels guilty. What did, what did Paul call himself? You remember what Paul called himself? I am the chief of sinners. all sinners. Why do you think he said that? Because he believes it. Because he was you know, walking around and he was a womanizer? No. He was the chief of all sinners because, yes, he did struggle like all of us struggle. But he called himself the chief of all sinners because of what he did to God's church. Go ahead. The first verse is Saul sinning. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But the point is, though, it's, that's the reason why he calls himself the chief of all sinners, because of the guilt of what he did to all of those men and women, all of those families he destroyed by uh, breaking them up and imprisoning them and torturing them. So you look at all this information. Both men and women were dragged away from their homes and imprisoned. And this Jewish persecution that tells us here in Acts chapter 8, that began here in chapter 8, widespread Jewish persecution, not just from the leaders, but from amongst all of, the, of their brethren lasted for 30 years. Let that sink in. 30 years that lasted until it was replaced by Roman persecution, state-sponsored persecution. Pat? Um, it's not the major. Just thinking about that um, transition from uh, the stoning of Stephen and Paul Saul just being there and them laying the coat yep. at his feet or whatever, right? Until basically that day he went from just being a just a bystander and a watcher to getting into it and being a the main chief. Yeah. yeah. Well, and remember, he was a Pharisee. He was a bystander in the sense that he was there that day. Um, but we don't know what, if he already had letters. I know we learned that he goes and he gets letters so he could go outside of Jerusalem to go to other places, which then he would have needed a letter from the high priest, right? He would have needed a, approval to do that. Um, so there's a good chance he may have already been in the midst of the persecution, but he wasn't the one stoning Stephen, but he was sitting there giving hearty approval. And so, you know, by definition, he was just as guilty. Um, well, Tyler? Hey, I don't want to beat up on <clears throat> the old Paul too much. But, I mean, if he's running around and getting his head in the middle of all this stuff, he must have heard. I mean, it's not just, hey, this Jesus guy is from God. There was the miracles. There was the prophecies that were being fulfilled and the scripture that was being quoted. I mean, he, he had to understand some of that, yeah. but just not buy into it. Uh, yeah, he would have had to have understood some of that. And um, But at the, at the end of the day... You look at it, and it's not. This isn't even to me. It's not even beating up on on Saul. It's just pointing out the fact of why God used him, and then how he became. I don't want to say the savior of the church because that's obviously the wrong terminology because we know there's only one savior. But you can see how he dedicated his life moving forward once Jesus came to him on the road to Damascus. From that day forward. Uh, he was all in, like, I can't think of any other really example of somebody uh, who probably suffered as much as he did and was martyred after a long period of time of God using him. Good. Paul, uh, Saul, grew up like, like everybody did, learning, you're being taught by yeah. the leaders of the church and your family, and, and we, he didn't actually witness any of the miracles. But he hears all these stories, and there were there were lots of stories going on. Yeah. He didn't believe them; he didn't see them. Yeah. But he was he was brought up to be, uh, like you said, very yeah. vigorous about following up on how he was yeah. taught to believe. He was he was a And, and I guess the bottom word. line is really we don't really know 
you know, we can really assume a lot of things, I guess, but we don't really know what he saw or didn't see, you know what I mean, when it came to Jesus, right? The Bible literally gives us zero information on that. It gives us really zero information on, on his life before uh, he became the Apostle Paul, other than the fact that it tells us that he was a Pharisee and, and talks about he was born of the tribe of Benjamin on the eighth day and, you know, he was the Jew of Jews, right, and all this. But outside of that, we really don't know a whole lot, right? We just know, though, that we know that God chose him to be a uh, chosen instrument of his, Barb. I was just going to say, as a Pharisee, he was a separate kind of a Jew. He wasn't yep. your normal Jew. He was above them. He was very, very rigorous. Smart. He was very yep. limited, very narrow-minded, very stringent in his beliefs. Yep. And so to accept Jesus was just like... Yeah, and if you remember what I said last week, it wasn't until last week's lesson that the Pharisees kind of got in the game. Because before that, for the first six, seven years, it was the Sadducees who were the main persecutors. And so why? Because of the problem they had with, you know, they didn't believe in the resurrection, right? They didn't believe in the spirit. They didn't believe in certain aspects, right? And so, but it wasn't until the Pharisees fully realized that, wait a second, he's not just, it's not just a matter of any more of a problem with what, what he's teaching in regards to the resurrection, all of a sudden he's looking to potentially bring down the whole system and change out the whole law. And all of a sudden, so the Pharisees begin to stand up, and then that's where you see the Pharisees had a bigger influence over the people, and they start to then uh, rile the people up. Uh, Diane and then Gina? That's something that keeps going through my mind here is I, I see a, like a mob mentality. It's almost as if they... They were so cranked up that even even Saul to not even be able to hear truth because they were just so defending Moses' law yeah. that even, it didn't matter what they saw. So it, all of that happening, and then years later when the Romans started persecuting, it's like it was easy to just fall into Roman persecution because of the the mob mentality that had been taking place all that time. Yeah, that's a lot of truth to that. Gina? I just want to know: was he Jewish and a Roman citizen? Yeah, yeah, he was a Roman citizen. Um, because of his upbringing where he was born, uh, and then he was also a Jew. Yep. David, in his own words in Philippians, he says, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, capital L, yep. found blameless. Yep. So he was convinced because of his background, because of his education, because of the people he hung around with yep. to get that education, he was convinced in his own mind that he was right. In and I believe, too, if you go back and you look at something, something that a little tidbit that we do know about Paul is that he was trained up as a Pharisee by Gamaliel, right? Gamaliel was one of the only open-minded Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Remember when, they, when uh, they got all up in arms and they wanted to just, you know, they wanted to kill and they wanted to imprison and kill and flog the, the apostles in, in chapters 3 and 4? Yeah. After he sees what's going on, he's like, guys, time out. Time out. Let, let, let's remove the witness from the, the courtroom, please. And they had like, right, they had a powwow. And he gives them some good sound advice. They accept the sound advice. They scourge them anyways, but then they send them out. But it was, you know, he, Paul, was trained up by somebody who really probably was pure in heart in the sense that he was probably considered blameless under the law, right? And so, again, it doesn't mean perfect, but blameless in the sense. But you? I just want to go back to what Tyler was saying about not beating up on him so much because it's the same scenario with a lot of people today. You know, like um, if you weren't, I wasn't raised in the Church of Christ, okay? And when people started approaching me after I married Lewis and everything about uh, you should believe this, you should be, believe that, and that's the way it is, and that there's no other way. Yeah. But when you've been raised in a different Place, yeah, and you've heard things your whole life. It's very difficult. Yeah, you know, it's not. It's not like you can just turn it off with a switch. Yeah, you know, it's 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 one of the most difficult things I had to do in my life because of the way I was brought up, and my grandfather was a preacher, and you know, and what what was in here was when what I read was what I was I believed. Yeah, you know, and nobody on earth could tell me that I was wrong yeah you know so it's you know and to me it's not even like i said it's not even a beating up of paul in the sense of what he believed it was the fact of what did he do 
right? He was a persecutor of the church. He was imprisoning people. He, sat, he stood by and gave the hearty approval of the, of the murder of somebody, right? Yeah. And, and, which was an illegal uh, killing, by the way. You know, they didn't even do it legally. They didn't even do it according to the, their own law. They were so full of rage that they rushed at him and they killed him. And I gave you guys those facts last week. Uh, but at the end of the day, we talk about all this because as we move forward now here, as we get through chapter 8 and then into chapter 9, you're going to see how this man who became, who was the great persecutor of the church, he did more probably harm individually than any other individual outside of like Rome up until the point to where he becomes a disciple. And then he's all in to doing everything he can to make kind of, uh, you know, Right the wrong, right? I, I the right the ship. I understand that. Yeah. Go ahead, Butch. Okay, I, was, I, I understand that. No. You know, but sometimes when we try to teach people, mm -hmm. you know, we have to make sure that we don't overwhelm them and we mm -hmm. don't chastise them for what they have been taught before. You know, it's going to take time sometimes. Oh, yeah, know? it's going to take time for sure. And, you know, I just... Uh, and I have been with, you know, people who are teaching, you know, and everything says, no, this is what you learn. You mm -hmm. know, this is what it is. Yeah. And my thing is, like, that's going to turn people away more than it is to bring them in. And, and that's why you guys have heard me say before, and I know we're running out of time here, uh, but when we bring the message to people, and I use Jesus and his disciples as a perfect example, Jesus would purposely say things to cause division, right? Right? Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Why did Jesus say those words? Because he knew there were people following him with, uh, with false pretenses, right? Insincere hearts. They, insincere hearts for the wrong reasons. As they were leaving, and most of them were leaving, he didn't chase after them and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let, 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 me, let me say something that's more, you know, you know, more to your liking. The point is, Jesus taught truth. He did, always did it in love. He wasn't yelling and screaming and pointing fingers. And those who left, he let leave. He had the ability, ability to, to read people's hearts, so, which helps him teach the right yes. lesson at the right time. He had that ability, which would be really handy. Yeah. <laughs> it would be very handy, right? But we, they'll be fine in another minute. But we, right, when we take the message to people, which is right, we have to make sure we always do it calmly. We always do it with gentleness and love. You never uh, sacrifice the truth. You're willing to... To tell them the hard things with gentleness and love. And you allow the seed to be planted, and then God gives the increase. It may not even be in your lifetime. It may not be this week, next week. It may not be for 10 years down the road. But if God's going to water it, if God's going to give the increase, we just have to do our part. I told you, we, 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 don't, we don't have a batting average. 300, 320, you get in the Hall of Fame. That means you failed like 6.7, 6.8% of the time, right? But God just says, you just have to take the seed. You don't have to convert them all. He said, just go tell them about me. Tell them about my love and show them my love through your life. Let's go to God for it. Wait, Dave. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so Betty Stone called me today and said that her neighbor beat her up or something. And she had to go to what? the hospital. So she was asking. Betty Parsons to, Stone? Yeah. yeah that's right. Uh, asking. Um, uh, church to pray for, and I asked her if she called the elders, and she said, "No, you tell." Them. So I'm just. All right. All right. Well, that's horrible. Let's go to God in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time, uh, and Father, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together tonight, study your Word, have a deeper, fuller understanding of of who people are, like the like Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, like Philip, and so many others, uh, Stephen. Uh, and, and it's the great faith that he had. And Father, it's such a, a, just a great opportunity to learn about these men, learn about their faith, their ups and downs, what they did right, what they did wrong, and how we could learn from this information. And I pray, Father, that our hearts and minds are always open to, to taking your message out into the world by feeding our minds uh, and our souls with this information and allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us as we go out to the mission field of the world. Father, we pray for our sister, uh, Betty Stone uh, Parsons, and we just pray, Father, uh, that for her to, uh, she was in an altercation with a neighbor, and uh, we just pray, Father, that uh, she wasn't uh, hurt badly, and we pray that uh, if she has any injuries, that she'll heal quickly, and we pray that, uh, that, that uh, peace could uh, come between her and her neighbor for whatever the situation is. Father, we pray that um, 
uh, just a, a bl your blessing on her and that situation. Father, we continue to pray for all those that are on the prayer list. We uh, thank you for the uh, positive news that we received uh, on uh, Fred Landry and his, uh, his brain scan was clear. And so we thank you for that answered prayer. And we just pray continued blessings upon Fred, uh, upon, uh, upon the Lance family, uh, upon uh, Brianna, uh, Teresa Zalea. Uh, Father, I know we just have many people uh, that are on the list right now. Uh, and I know uh, many of their names uh, uh, are not coming to mind, but we know that you know who they are. We know you know their needs, and we pray a special blessing as they would have need. Father, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everybody.